It's a real pleasure to speak to you today, Bob. I'm a huge fan. I'm loving uh, the podcast series so far. I mean, I, I, I spoke to my dad uh, just today about this case and obviously the fact that I was speaking to you. And he was saying to me he's never been able to let it go. He's never been able to shake uh, what he saw on that kind how, of... Thing. How old is your dad? How old is uh, My dad's 64. Four, I think now. So, so he would have yeah. he would have been quite young. He would have been sort of a child at the time. Right, right, he right. He remembers exactly where he was, like everyone does. And it just it everybody like does. Every single person who went through that will remember it. For mm. us in America, it was a national trauma. Mm. We all experienced it, and I will never ever forget it. And I know exactly where I was. I remember exactly what was happening, and I've never been able to to let it go. Because I mean, what what, what what is it, do you think, that exactly that has stirred people for this amount of time? And do you think you've got any closure now from, from having made this podcast series on that? Well, I, I, I don't know if you'll ever get complete closure because so many of the people who were involved are dead now. But I do feel satisfied that we've answered the major questions. I mean, first of all, it was a conspiracy. There's no, no, no doubt about that. Based on all the evidence that we've all looked at over the years, there is no question about that. The question is who was involved and, and how they were involved and who were the shooters and where were they positioned? That's all something that unless you have really studied this and looked at it over 60 years, you won't get a feeling of everything. I. It's been an obsession for me for a long, long time. And little bits and pieces of information come out every once in a while. And for most people, they just look at it and they go, oh, that's interesting. They're not thinking of it as to how does that piece of information fit into the overall. And that's what we try to do with the podcast. It's based on all the reading I've done on it, all of the people I've talked to. I've been to Dealey Plaza many times talk to everybody who was alive and that was there that day, talk to forensic experts um, and talk to, you know, CIA people who understand how these operations happen. And so for me, there is a, a satisfaction of knowing essentially what happened there. Yeah. But whether there will be exact closure, no, no, I don't think there will be. And th does conspiracy still shock you? Because it's one of those things where it almost feels like a cinematic device. You read about it in the news and stuff and you go, oh, there's been this conspiracy or government cover up and things like this. And when it actually happens, does it still shock you that it's kind of actually going on in the real world that we're living in? Well, yes, it does. I mean, and, and when you hear the word conspiracy or you talk, you hear the phrase conspiracy theory, you know, you conjure up people with tin tinfoil hats and they're QAnon or whatever they are. But the truth of the matter is there are actual conspiracies. Mm -hmm. Those things do happen. And there are actual cover-ups. You know, we saw it happening with Watergate. We've seen it happen in, you know, we saw it happen with uh, getting into Iraq with weapons of mass destruction. We know that these things happen and the thing that's most shocking is that a president could be assassinated in broad daylight in, 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 on an American street. That's the shocking part of it. And that people would go to the lengths that they go to to make sure nobody knows what really happened that day. That's, that's disturbing. So, you know, yes, there are political scandals. You've had them in, in, in Great Britain. There have been all over the world, there are scandals. But this is a big one. This is a really big one where elements of the United States government would actually take out a president. That's that's very disturbing stuff. We know based on all the information we have that's come out uh, and we've all read it. We know that the CIA was involved in extrajudicial killings. That's on record. We know that that happened. The idea that they might be tangentially in some way, in a rogue way, involved in killing one of their own, in killing their own president. That's the disturbing part. Because, I mean, we kind of, as a 
society as a world i suppose we're kind of we really obsessed with true crime it's become this kind of phenomenon, particularly in recent years you know with the but it's, it's also become quite sort of titillating and so built on that kind of netflix model of suspense wanting to keep you watching every episode i'm interested when you're putting this together in that balance in depicting this on those entertaining terms but also appreciating it's real and being sensitive to the material was that quite tricky because we can fall into the trap sometimes of it, treating it is, something as though it it's tricky it, yeah. it's very tricky um you know i've said and i say it at the first episode this is the greatest murder mystery in the history of america i mean maybe in the world i mean nobody has had a murder mystery like this and they're how and so if you're going to go about trying to solve it and figure out what happened you got to do just what any detective would do in looking at a murder who are the suspects who has a motive what are the forensics what are the circumstances surrounding what happened at the time? And we try to lay all that out. Uh, you can't do it in one minute. You have to kind of lay it out. So we try to lay it out just like a prosecutor would lay out a case. You know, you have opening statements, which we kind of do in the first couple of episodes. And then you have to present the evidence that backs up that opening statement. And that's what we try to do. Well, I was just interested to know at what stage you decided it would be like a podcast. Were there, were there ever any thoughts of doing this a doc series? And, and also, given your kind of aptitude for kind of storytelling, did this feel like you were still a writer or a filmmaker putting this together? Or did you, did you take on a new role as a, as a podcast host? Well, I tried to learn the grammar of podcasting, you know, and, and, and you know, doing something in 10 episodes. But I am a storyteller. And initially, I thought this would make an, a good uh you know limited series let's say and i did uh, present it to paramount at one point and they did they optioned three of the books that i was interested in and also uh, spent some development money in developing the first three scripts for the for the show but then the guy who was running that got fired so we then were left with nothing and they disbanded the project and then i started thinking, what's another way to do it? And it wasn't until I started listening to podcasts and there was the one about Saeed, what was the, uh, Adnan Saeed, that was an interesting one. And then we listened to uh, Rachel Maddow's uh, one about, uh, the, it was called Bagman, which was about uh, Spiro Agnew. And then we heard a podcast that Soledad O'Brien uh, did, which is why I went to her to see if she was interested, it was called Murder on the Towpath. Mm -hmm. And that was all about the murder of a wife of a CIA agent who was separated at the time from this guy, Cord Meyer, her name was Mary Meyer, and she's walking in Georgetown and she gets murdered. She gets assassinated. And this was right after the Warren Commission report came out. And the day that she gets assassinated, James Angleton, who's the head of counterintelligence for the CIA, and Ben Bradley, who was the you know, editor of the Washington Post, show up at her, her studio, her art studio, and they take this diary of hers, and it's never seen again, because she had been having an affair with John Kennedy for a year, and uh, she was the sister of the woman who was married to Ben Bradley. So I listened to that, and they lay it out how that happened. I thought, okay, well, this is the way to to approach this. I thought I loved the the dynamic between yourself and Soledad. I think there was a great balance in you coming at it from your kind of- Well, she, she was, you know, she wasn't even born, you know, when this happened. So, and she hadn't followed it the way I've been following it, who had affected me directly. Um, so it was almost, it's like I'm telling her the story and she's listening almost for the first time in a way. I mean, she knows basic things about it, but she doesn't know all these little ins and outs and the specifics of it. And I mean, obviously it's, it's clear from listening to, to the podcast and you speaking today that it has had a big effect on you and it has had an effect on a whole generation of Americans. I mean, you speak about that kind of collective trauma. Do you, I'm interested to know as a storyteller, do you think an incident like this is enough to have changed and impacted maybe even the way you've gone on to tell stories in your profession? Well, I don't know about that. I mean, I'm like everybody else. I mean, I love a good, you know, a mystery, you know, uh, you know, murder and a mystery and how, who solves it. You know, I, I've always liked those kinds of things. So, um, I, but I never made one, you know, I never made one. I, 
I always just get drawn to the things that I'm interested in. I mean, I made only one thriller in my life, which was misery. And uh, I had never done that before, but I was interested in the subject matter and what it was about. So here I've been, my whole life been interested in it. And so it's always trying to find what is the best form? What's the best form to tell this story, to tell, you know, what had happened here? My dad really wants to go to the the spot. It happened <laughs> um, yeah. as well. Yeah, and I, I quite want to, because I'm going to New York next week and I want to go to a couple of the places we see him when Harry met Sally. What, what do you <laughs> think we get as audience members, whether it be real life situations or, or cinematic films and stuff like that, where something about going to the spot, something happens, just seems to be so, I don't know, appealing to people. It, it is. And I can tell you, because I've been to Dealey Plaza many times, that it you do have an a, a it's a different effect mm -hmm. than hearing or seeing a film of the president's motorcade going through Dealey Plaza when you're actually there and you see how, it's first of all it's very small mm -hmm. you don't you think of it it's such a big uh, event that happened that it would be this big no it's very small and contained and as a matter of fact I recreated that whole um, assassination for a film I did called LBJ mm -hmm. which was with Woody Harrison played LBJ and we did the entire the entire thing so uh, it does affect you differently when you actually see these places for sure I, I just on that to note of me sort of heading when I go to New York and going to sort of find a couple of places when Harry met Sally I mean that's quite small fry but you've made films of real cult followings have you ever heard of something truly astounding a fan has done the length someone has gone to 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 show support for a film you've made well yeah for Princess Bride there's an amazing amount of uh, fan connection. People have used that theme to get married. They put inside their wedding rings, as you wish. I mean, there's all kinds of, uh, you know, stuff, you know, with Princess Bride and, and then Spinal Tap too. There are a lot of people uh, connect to that. So, yeah, I mean, a lot of the films I've made have kind of made their way into the uh, lexicon of, of people's lives. And I'll tell you one, I made a film called Bucket List yeah, years yeah. ago with Jack Nicholson and Morgan Freeman. And everybody thinks that that term has been around for a million years. And that term was created for the film. That's okay. the first time we have, okay. and everybody thinks, well, it's a bucket list, it's on your bucket list, you know? Mm -hmm. So. Like, but I, because I can't, I mean, you mentioned about what your films mean to people. I mean, I can't have a chat with you today without telling you what your films have meant to me. I mean, I feel like as a kid, I properly laughed for the first time watching Spinal Tap and I properly cried watching a movie, watching Stand By Me. And I found an affliction for knitted sweaters when I first met, watched When Harry Met Sally, which is no, this is no joke, but it is literally in my top five films of all time. I mean, you've got such a legacy in cinema. Do you ever stop and sort of take that all in. I mean, we don't naturally give ourselves too much praise uh, as people, but you've made a lot of people happy. It must be quite a good feeling. Do you ever sort of bask? It, it, it does make me feel good, you know, and a lot of times, like <clears throat> yesterday, I did, we just flew to New York, we're there now. And yesterday somebody came up to me at the airport and he said, I heard your voice and I just, I know that I don't want to bother you. I know that you get this, and but I just want to tell you how much you mean to me and all this stuff. And it's never a bother. I mean, it's it's a great feeling to know that you've made other people feel good and that they've enjoyed something, it, it, that you've done something in their life for even if it's a moment in the movie theater, that that does make me feel good. You know, I don't go out to do it that for that reason. I go out because this is what I think I would like to talk about or say, and it was my mind works this way. But then the fact that people get pleasure out of it that is a, that's a great reward. Yeah, brilliant. Well, like I saw uh, Gladiator this week. I mean, Ridley Scott's still going, Scorsese's still going. Hopefully you've still got a lot of great projects left. Yeah, in listen, the guy, you know, <laughs> Scorsese's in his 80s, you know, and I, I got a couple more. I just yeah. did this film with Albert Brooks. Mm. You know, uh, it's a documentary about Albert Brooks. I don't know if they get it at the UK yet, but you'll, it's on the HBO Max, so check it out i mean i don't know if you know albert brooks or oh i love albert brooks yeah well yeah. you'll you'll see it it's 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 called albert brooks defending my life and i think it's pretty good i'll keep an eye well thank you so much for your time today rob i can't yeah. wait to keep going with this great series okay yeah. Brilliant. all right thanks Stefan. ladies and gentlemen you're watching hey you guys hey you guys <laughs> hey you guys <laughs> 
okay. That's what they all say. Hey, you guys! Hey, you guys!